Hello and welcome to this Alumni Festival event. Um, we will be hearing today from Dr. John Weisweiler from the Faculty of Classics. He's a lecturer in Classics and we'll have a Q&A with him at the end. And I'm very, very pleased to introduce his paper, his lecture today on capital in the Roman Empire. He is a specialist in inequality in the Roman world and the social history of Rome. So I'm going to hand over to him now. Thank you. Well, it is a great pleasure uh, to speak to this audience. Uh, it's a pity that already the second time this festival takes place only uh, online. Uh, I hope that at one point we will again be able to see each other in person. It's one of the greatest pleasures of uh, teaching in Cambridge are uh, the students. And uh, so to meet the, uh, the former students is always uh, great fun and uh, makes these, these events also for us uh, very exciting. I mean, I couldn't think of a better audience uh, than uh, Cambridge students, but Cambridge students who are now actually adults. Uh, I uh, talked today about uh, capital in the Roman empire, in particular about inequality in the Roman Empire. Um, this is, of course, a topic which uh, is in the news a great deal and concerns um, all of us. Um, over uh, the last uh, 30 to 40 years, economic inequality all over the Americas and Western Europe has greatly uh, increased. I give you here just as an example, the numbers for income inequality in the United Kingdom, but I could give you uh, similar figures uh, for almost all Western European and American states. What you see here is that whereas uh, in the early uh, 20th uh, century, income inequality is uh, decreasing, the super rich or the merely rich uh, slowly uh, lose, uh, slow, slowly uh, control a lesser share of uh, the overall income earned by uh, of, the, of, the, of the overall uh, national income. Uh, this changes from the late 1970s and 80s onwards. And uh, now it is the case that the top 10% of uh, wage earners in the UK uh, control more than one third of all income and the top 1% uh, alone more than uh, one eighth. If we looked at wealth inequality, uh, the numbers would be even more stark. Um, this increase in inequality has uh, generated a great uh, deal of interest in this topic uh, in all the social sciences and but, but especially in economics and of course here the uh, most influential most well-known contribution is that by the French economist uh, Thomas Piketty uh, in his capital in the 21st century English translation published in 2013, who made probably the most influential attempt to explain why inequality is so high all over the Euro-American world today. He claims that uh, inequality is the product of a fundamental economic law. In his view, uh, the reason why the rich over the last years uh, steadily become richer is that uh, the rich disproportionately uh, make their money through investments and uh, returns on investments uh, grow faster than income. Whereas in uh, 
uh, most advanced economies over the long term growth is uh, only around one uh, percent. I mean, it can of course be higher if you catch up like uh, East Asia over the last uh, half a century. Or it can be higher if you have population growth. But if you really look at net growth um, per year uh, over the long term, it, is, uh, it has never been higher than 1%. And uh, so if growth uh, is only uh, 1%, usually uh, also income, uh, average income, wage income uh, grows at the same rate. So that is also uh, around 1%. However, if you uh, invest uh, wealth, if you buy a house uh, and uh, rent it out, or if you uh, invest uh, on the share market over the very long term, usually uh, you have a return of uh, 5% per year uh, on your investments. So the, this, uh, this proportion of 5% return on investments and uh, 1%, which is how your wages would grow uh, every year, uh, if all things remain equal, this leads to a situation where uh, capital owners each year control a larger share uh, of the economy. And in his view, in Piketty's view, this leads to a situation where uh, inequality increases because uh, the, Alp, the, the rich generally uh, uh, de depend more on capital income than on uh, wage earnings to make their money. And so uh, that is in his view uh, why inequality has increased over the last uh, 40 years. Uh, if in the 20th century uh, uh, inequality actually decreased, this was just a fluke in his view. Uh, during the wars, uh, much capital was destroyed. Also, there were high wealth taxes high and high taxes on extremely high incomes but since that has ended we revert to a historical uh, 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 mean where uh, just the rich steadily get richer and even starker uh, 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 interpretation of world economic history, even, uh, even more depressing interpretation of world economic history was put forward by the Roman historian Walter Scheidel. Uh, in his view, uh, the steady rise in inequality is not merely uh, uh, the, the story of uh, uh, capital capitalism say of the last two centuries but it's really the story of all of uh, human history or at least of all sedentary societies so in his view in inequality not only uh, just increased uh, over the last uh, uh, 200 years but it really this uh, the, the fact that the rich steadily get richer is something which happens all over agrarian societies all over history uh, on, on the one hand, this is also in his view due to the P dynamics uh, explained by Piketty that capital income rises faster than wage income, but it is also uh, because of predation that once you control, once you build, once you control uh, large states, uh, you can dip into tax income, or if you uh, have an army and you can uh, plunder a population. These profits from predation are again much higher than what you could ever uh, make uh, through labor. And again, as a result, uh, uh, the elites of all states throughout history uh, steadily uh, become richer, and over time, uh, the size of private fortunes increases. The only way to uh, uh, disrupt this steady increase in inequality in his view are, uh, uh, are uh, pandemics, uh, transformative uh, revolutions which go along uh, with mass murder, um, mass mobilization, war and uh, state collapse. 
But even these uh, events, all of them very bloody, uh, can only dial back the clock of inequality for a while before inequality increases again. So also in his view, uh, a steady rise in inequality uh, is basically uh, inevitable. Uh, now, it's of course not uh, so surprising that in an era in which uh, inequality uh, in has uh, steadily increased, uh, also social scientists uh, develop theories which uh, claim that inequality is in some ways uh, natural or develops uh, quite easily and reinforces itself. Uh, but as historians, uh, what is exciting about our uh, field is that we actually have the opportunity to test these uh, hypotheses and uh, explore how things uh, in some moments of history in, in other societies actually worked quite differently than uh, they do today and actually to question what we think is uh, natural by just looking at the contemporary world. And of course, uh, uh, one of the most, uh, in my view, one of the most uh, exciting areas of history you can look at to test these hypotheses is the ancient world and particularly the Roman Empire. I think it's a particularly interesting case study uh, for the history of inequality uh, for two reasons. So on one hand, Rome, the Roman Empire is the largest and best documented state in pre-modern Western Eurasia, only China uh, would uh, probably equal uh, that. Um, but for antiquity, we also don't have the same quality of documentation we have uh, for inequality in the Roman Empire. So for that reason, it's a great case study. On the other hand, Rome is a great case study for uh, economic history because many of the institutions which have uh, been developed in the Roman Empire shaped subsequent European and uh, American history, most importantly, uh, Roman law, but also the political systems uh, created in the Roman Empire. Uh, uh, Republican ideals, ideals of constitutional monarchy, if you want to call it like that, protection of property rights and so on. These are all in the particular ways in which we know them in uh, European and, and American history. They are all in some ways uh, an inheritance of the Roman Empire. So by, by studying uh, inequality in the Roman Empire, we uh, study a story which is is also quite relevant for us. So this is what I want to do uh, in the remainder uh, of this talk to look at to what extent these uh, dynamics uh, described by uh, Piketty and Scheidel apply uh, to the Roman Empire. Did the rich steadily become richer in the Roman Empire? Was Rome what Piketty calls an ownership society in which private property was uh, defended above all else? And so I will begin this, uh, the remainder of this talk by briefly discussing some features of the Roman world which uh, seem to fit Piketty's or Scheidel's model of such a, uh, of Rome as a pro capital owner society quite well. But then I will uh, uh, discuss some features which make actually Rome quite different from uh, what we see uh, today. And uh, so in a conclusion, I will try to bring these uh, two parts of my presentation today uh, together and uh, open a discussion. So I hope that uh, we will have a conversation about this, this topic uh, uh, after my uh, talk is concluded. So, uh, in some ways, uh, uh, there's quite good reason uh, for uh, Roman historians to actually think that uh, Roman history follows these uh, patterns described by modern historians, that Rome also was a society in which the rich steadily 
became richer. I want to point to three features which uh, 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 might support such an interpretation. Uh, so the first one is uh, the distinctive shape of the political economy of the Roman Empire. Rome really only had a very small state, what we could call uh, a minimalist uh, state. So for the whole Roman uh, central administration, only around 10,000 persons were directly employed by them. That, that is less than, uh, than for many uh, cities in um, uh, today's world. Probably Cambridge has more uh, employees than uh, 10,000. And in the Roman Empire, the whole uh, Mediterranean world and Near East were run by just 10,000 people. Uh, this was possible because all the key uh, power positions in the Roman Empire were held by uh, uh, ultra-rich landowners. So the top posts in the center, governorships, uh, the emperor himself, uh, top executive positions in the tax administration and so on were all held by very wealthy uh, Italian and later provincial landowners. Whereas in the provinces, in, uh, in the cities, uh, it would be local landowners who would uh, uh, fulfill the functions of government, who would serve as judges, who would collect taxes and so on. So you would have a government without bureaucracy because you really had a government uh, by and for the rich. As you would expect in such a state, taxes were comparatively low. We think that probably uh, net taxes were between 5 to 10% uh, of GDP. By contrast, property rights were very energetically enforced. Uh, that is what uh, Roman law in many ways uh, revolves around. Many of the most innovative institutes of Roman law um, uh, 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 were designed uh, to uh, protect property, property in land, and also property in human beings. You must never forget, of course, the Roman Empire was a slave society. So in many ways, uh, we might, the Roman Empire in that sense was an ideal, offered ideal conditions for wealth accumulation uh, and for the dynamics described by Piketty. Also, if we look at the numbers, uh, Piketty's, the Roman Empire seems to fit Piketty's theory quite well. Growth in the Roman world, even according to the most optimistic estimates, clearly was much lower than in the modern world, at most 0.1% per year. Uh, by contrast, capital income, income, for example, on loans, uh, would, between, it would be between 5 to 8% per year. So the gap between uh, rates of return on investment and growth was the same or even higher than today. So also from that perspective, it might seem as if this was an ideal world for the rich and the rich could indeed become steadily richer as Piketty has hypothesized. Uh, Finally, uh, not only in theory, uh, this Roman legal system worked quite effectively to defend property rights, but it actually also uh, was quite widespread uh, in practice, despite the relative weakness of this state. It was uh, access by uh, quite a broad, quite broad strata of the population. One piece of evidence we have from late third century, from the late third century, shows that uh, of all litigants uh, at the co at court, um, one quarter were women, and even uh, one twelfth were slaves. So even lower status individuals were able to access the courts. So on the one hand, you might think actually this shows uh, uh, how uh, effective the Roman system worked and uh, that it actually helped also broader strata uh, of the population. 
uh, but uh, in reality, what it meant above all also that uh, property rights would be defended and that if you were a wealthy landowner and you owned properties stretched all over the Roman Empire, you could rely on the Roman administration to defend these properties, even uh, if they were weeks away from where you lived. There's a lot of evidence for that. Uh, I will not uh, review it in detail here. Uh, it is, uh, I have it here in this presentation and I uh, can share it uh, and discuss it further uh, if you have questions uh, on that. So let me summarize. Uh, this first part of the presentation. So in view of the fact that returns on uh, capital were much higher than growth rates, and so then, uh, uh, then the, in, in, then, and also as a result, uh, returns on capital were higher than returns on wages. The fact that taxes were quite low and the fact that pro pro property rights were protected very well in the Roman world might seem, might, might make it seem as if uh, actually in the Roman Empire, uh, these dynamics described by Piketty uh, operated uh, fully and that the rich steadily became richer. There's also some evidence which might support that. Uh, some of the largest private fortunes in history are attested in the Roman Empire, so several texts discuss uh, uh, property owners who controlled fortunes of a size of uh, 200 to 400 million sesterzii, that's the equivalent of 80,000 uh, family farms or an estate in the size of uh, 200,000 hectares, so uh, entire counties controlled by one individual person. So uh also that might seem to support that the roman empire was really ideal provided an ideal uh, environment for the accumulation of wealth and that is indeed the interpretation which has also been endorsed by many roman historians uh most uh, famously by geoffrey de saint croix uh, a, a great marxist historian of the roman empire who uh uh, also developed one of the most beautiful images for that process. He said that the ultra rich in the Roman Empire, like uh, vampire bats sucking out uh, the blood of their victims, so the ultra rich in the Roman Empire sucked out the life blood of uh, Mediterranean of uh, of the peasants working the fields of the Mediterranean world, and so that these ultra rich vampire bats became steadily richer. And many other very eminent Roman scholars have also defended this theory. I already mentioned uh, Walter Scheidel most recently in his uh, uh, really excellent history of inequality in world history, the great leveler. Uh, however, uh, these uh, theories uh, nevertheless might disregard some of the ways in which the Roman Empire was different from the world in which we live uh, today. And so ultimately, I don't think they uh, quite uh, capture how the property regime in the Roman Empire really worked and how it differed from our own. Uh, so in the second part of this presentation, I would like to uh, give you three limits uh, of elite power, three ways in which the Roman Empire uh, differed from the world described by Piketty. So the first is that uh, 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 the ancient rich lacked opportunities to uh, invest their wealth Whereas we can, uh, if you have surplus wealth, can uh, just uh, uh, buy, say, an investment fund and uh, invest all over the world uh, under Roman communicative uh, conditions that would have been uh, much harder. There's only so much land uh, you can buy in your immediate uh, proximity. 
At the same time, the Roman rich uh, were under steady pressure to uh, share some of that wealth uh, with their ex inferiors and uh, were expected to pay vast sums for spectacles, civic infrastructures and other forms of munificence. So if despite the pandemic, you had some opportunities this summer to travel, if you were in uh, Croatia, if you were in uh, Greece, if you were in southern Turkey, and you uh, saw uh, the remnants of antiquity there, most of them come from the Roman period. But they were not built by the Roman state, these infrastructures, the uh, bath houses, the uh, columns, the uh, fountains, and uh, what have you. They were built by private capital. They were built by local elites, uh, or in Rome, uh, they were often financed uh, by uh, wealthy property owners in Rome. And so it is the fact that uh, the Roman ultra-rich were uh, always expected to invest a significant amount of their wealth in munificence uh, amounted to a de facto progressive tax and made the accumulation of wealth amongst the ultra-rich more difficult than it is uh, in the contemporary world. We see also how these pressures increased if we just track the ways in which uh, how much money uh, the ultra rich in Rome spent on munificence that steadily increases over time. Whereas, uh, as we will see later, uh, private wealth actually does not increase over time, the size of private fortunes declines. And so uh, this means that the ultra rich steadily paid a higher proportion of their wealth uh, for. Uh, munificence. A second uh, limit to the accumulation of wealth was that uh, for the ultra rich, uh, the uh, scope of the or the protections of Roman law only uh, uh, helped them uh, so far uh, because the Roman Empire was uh, uh, despotism, the rights of the emperor were uh, both in practice and in theory unlimited. If the emperor decided to uh, that one of the large landowners in the Roman Empire needed to be executed, uh, he could just order so and uh, that would happen. And uh, whatever you think uh, uh, of, say, the Emperor Nero and the stories which have been told about him, I recommend to you to go to the uh, exhibition in the British Museum at the moment, which uh, uh, gives many new perspectives on uh, his lives and times, whatever you think about him. Um, it is certainly clear uh, that uh, by him and by many other emperors, there's certainly uh, many that they killed many ultra rich inhabitants of the Roman Empire. Uh, so if we look again at the list of the larger of the richest landowners in the Roman Empire, which I presented uh, before, only one of these top 10 richest landowners uh, uh, died uh, in his bed. All others uh, were killed. Uh, um, some of them were directly executed by the emperor. Uh, others were uh, so poisoned by his wife. For example, Lentulus allegedly was poisoned by Augustus' wife, Olivia, after he made her his, her, his primary uh, heiress. Um, uh, Seneca, of course, uh, was forced into suicide by Nero and so on. So all of the, their wealth uh, then flowed back uh, into the imperial treasury and uh, to the Roman state. And so that led to a steady level of redistribution among uh, ultra-large fortunes. So this led to a situation where really uh, the, on the level of the ultra rich, uh, uh, it really seems a political factor dis decided the amount of wealth they controlled. 
So you see here, I just plotted how many, um, how much wealth do, uh, uh, I just plotted private fortunes, the size of private fortunes in the Roman Empire. On the left side, you see the size of these fortunes, the higher up, the larger the fortunes are. Uh, on the low, on the x-axis, uh, you see, uh, you see, uh, you you see the the year when they died, and so what you see here that over time uh, the size of fortunes does not increase but rather declines, and that is because uh, political instability uh, declined uh, over time. These spectacular murders and executions, which uh, fill the, the the history of Nero, Caligula, and all other uh, mad emperors of early Roman history, uh, they slow, that slowly came to an end. And as a result, less wealth was redistributed. And there were fewer uh, ultra-rich persons, uh, uh, both who accumulated that wealth by receiving it from the emperor, and, uh, both few, and also fewer ultra-rich persons who would be executed by the emperor uh, to secure that wealth. Uh, so what this graph very clearly shows is that in the Roman Empire, the Piketty model does not apply, and really that the rich did not steadily become richer here. Okay, so uh, let me just uh, then briefly summarize uh, uh, the, these, uh, the two parts of my presentation. So... Um, while at first sight it might seem that the Roman Empire really fulfills many of the conditions uh, described by Piketty, uh, you had property rights protected, you had in principle high rates of return on uh, investment. Uh, in practice, the Roman rich could not realize these opportunities because on the one hand, Roman, they, had, they lacked investment opportunities to be able uh, to, uh, uh, to, 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 to make more money out of the money they already controlled. And uh, also they were expected to redistribute much of that wealth. So as a result, capital income in the Roman empire did not inevitably increase more swiftly than labor income. Uh, secondly, political and economic success uh, depended on the favor of the emperor, and uh, that was uh, uh, notoriously uh, fickle, and so um, the emperor uh, could remove his favor from you, which would have terrible economic consequences for you. Similarly, if you were politically unsuccessful in the Roman Republic, uh, you maybe you might be banished like Cicero, which would again mean that your many of your properties might be confiscated, your private house in Rome might be plundered, as happened to Cicero when he was exiled. So uh, again, in this world in which economics and politics were inextricably intertwined, uh, your uh, opportunities to maintain this wealth over a long time uh, was quite limited. Okay, so I think here I want to end so that we still have some time for discussion. I heard that at 5.50 we will all be unceremoniously kicked out of that room. So I hope we have some time to talk until then. Oh no. Hello. Okay, I lost you for a second. Um oh, whoops, I don't hear anything. Uh, Okay. Um, uh, it's in the chat. Okay, so I, I think I lost my.
uh, Zoom. I'm sorry, can you? Uh, So I'm not in Zoom anymore. Sorry, I have some trouble here. Or can you can maybe somebody read me the the, the question? I'm sorry, just until that moment. The moment. Ah, now I have it here. Okay, great. So uh, question one: Where the repeated edicts against alienations of small holding, notably those resulting from military service, an effective tool against the concentration of wealth. Um, so this refers, this question refers uh, uh, to, the, to the period of the Roman Republic when uh, uh, some um, populists, uh, politicians uh, made efforts to uh, prevent uh, the uh, as this, uh, as David Singer uh, uh, says, uh, uh, to prevent um, the concentration of wealth amongst the rich, um, uh, probably not, um, because so all across this uh, period of Roman conquest, we see that uh, the the, uh, the size of private fortune steadily uh, increases. Um, but while these uh, laws may not have helped to prevent the concentration of private wealth, what they may have helped is to uh, protect at least uh, small holdings. We believe now that probably a much larger proportion of um, the Italian population profited from the Roman conquest of the Mediterranean from empire, um, then uh, we used to. So while empire was certainly a bad thing for almost, for the great majority of inhabitants of the Mediterranean world, uh, for many Italian landowners, it may actually have been a good thing. Um, so how does today's charitable giving by the ultra-rich compare to the munificence of wealthy Romans? Um, today's munificence, I mean, particularly in the United States, needs to, of course, be seen uh, in context of the tax um, benefits uh, the ultra-rich derive from munificence and particularly uh, uh, from uh, uh, new legal institutions such as uh, permanent trusts and so on. Um, so in scale, Roman uh, charitable giving was certainly uh, higher than today's. Uh, Somebody asks the excellent question, Jürgen from uh, Vienna, what are the sources on which this evidence, on which this discussion is based? So our sources are very limited, of course, always in Roman history, uh, particularly to get by numbers is very hard. Um, sometimes uh, ancient literary texts, ancient historians mention how much wealth was allegedly controlled by different private individuals, but we never quite know how much we can trust them. A better form of evidence are uh, tax records, documentary texts, uh, but they only survive from one region of the Roman Empire, from Egypt, where uh, papyri um, did not decompose what were preserved in the desert sand. And what we see there is that uh, inequality actually surprisingly, again, doesn't uh, seem to have increased over time. So somebody asks me, Sue Fa Fa Famine asks another excellent question. So to what extent uh, did uh, those po those members of the Roman elite who were not engaged in politics, 
yeah, the so-called equitas, to what extent might they have actually have larger opportunity, they may have actually become richer more quickly than those who were uh, engaged in politics uh, because they were not expected to pay for munificence. Um, indeed, we have some texts which say that uh, some people prefer not to go into politics, to be not uh, subject to these pressures. So, for example, one of the brothers of Seneca alleged, allegedly went into business uh, to just make money on his own without being bothered by an emperor who might force you to commit suicide at the end of your life, like Seneca. Um, uh, so that might certainly have been the case in some cases. However, uh, at the same time, um, uh, it is also the case that uh, nowhere could you win as large fortunes as you could in uh, politics. So when I showed you that list of ultra wealthy uh, individuals, uh, all of them were involved in uh, politics. So the top 10 or top 20 richest Romans known, all of them were politicians. Um, so uh, while that brought disadvantages, uh, on the one hand, you were expected to share some of your wealth with uh, the Roman population, and also you might you might not die a peaceful death. Uh, uh, still, it was certainly the most profitable uh, profession. So politics was the most profitable profession. What were the inheritance rule in the Roman Empire? Somebody asks me if one of the ultra rich was killed, how was the money distributed? Usually those who, um, so if if that person was killed in the in the as a result of a, or committed suicide uh, in the wake of uh, a trial, in the wake say of a treason trial, then the accusers would receive some of that wealth. In general, it is also important that in the Roman Empire there was no primogeniture, so all sons and also all daughters were expected to inherit equally. So this is another factor which may have promoted the dispersal of wealth in the Roman Empire. Then uh, there is another very interesting question. Uh, so how was the expansion of the empire funded? Did this provide investment opportunities for the spare capital of the rich? Yes, in fact, I just uh, finished an article about exactly that process. So in uh, some regions of the Roman Empire, the rich built up vast new industries, uh, vast new, uh, highly profitable forms of agribusiness, and particularly uh, there were two forms of investment which were highly profitable, that was wine and that was olive oil. So in North Africa, uh, there was a, and in Southern Spain in particular, highly profitable uh, olive oil industries uh, were built up in the Roman Empire and that must have been funded by the wealth of the ultra rich. Uh, uh, so that did indeed happen. Uh, so um, somebody notes correctly that the most recent table I offered only runs to the year 200 and whether I looked at the situation in later periods. And yes, I have. In fact, that's my specialization. So in later periods, inequality does not uh, increase uh, in the fourth century uh, or in the period just before the fall of the Roman Empire, the rich have not become richer than before. Somebody else asks again about uh, sources. I think I've already answered that question before. Then there's a question by Richard Smitenar, uh, who, 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 who makes a very good point. He says the ultra-rich were subject to confiscation of their wealth by the emperor. 
where they're merely rich, able to fly under the radar here and sustain and possibly grow their wealth longer term? I think this is a really, really good question. And uh, the problem here is that our sources focus on the super wealthy because they are interested uh, in them. These are the most spectacular cases, uh, most exciting cases, most entertaining cases. And uh, we might expect that these, uh, the, the dynamics described by Piketty uh, might still apply on a lower level of wealth. Uh, it's sometimes some is a question I cannot fully answer at the moment. It's a, it's actually a problem I try to uh, resolve uh, in a project I am just beginning, where I try to model the distribution of wealth in the Roman Empire over the very over the very long term and how how different factors may have uh, decreased or increased. Uh, inequality over multiple generations. So I, I will, with some collaborators, try to build up a computer model, which may help us to answer that question more rigorously. But at the moment, I can't answer it. But it's a really, really good point. Please comment on how Messinas might be different from Jeff Bezos in terms of their super wealth. Well, the, the major difference is that the Roman ultra-rich all made their money through politics, whereas uh, today's ultra-rich some uh, make their money, money through their political connections, but not all of them. I mean, Jeff Bezos, of course, politics plays an important role in the defense of his wealth. Uh, but um, he uh, did not make his money through politics. Um, Peter Calvert points out that um, even though the Roman bureaucracy was small, they had a substantial army and didn't the army fulfill some of the functions of a bureaucracy? Um, I, so I would say that the army maybe fulfilled some functions of policing, uh, uh, but even that army was comparatively small uh, if you compare it to modern army or modern police forces. Uh, so while they help with tax collecting, they help with dispersing revolt, uh, they couldn't do much more than that. But yes, uh, uh, here they, they, they played an important role in backing up the property of the ultra-rich. I think we only have seconds left. It was very good to talk to you, and I hope that another time we can all uh, see each other in person again. It was a great pleasure, and uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the Alumni Festival.